the range of programs and projects that um, are funded to protect the reef, to protect that catchment, the water quality, and to enable the humans to play a role in protection of the um, catchment and reef. We have two amazing presenters for you today. So Julie Steele um, comes from the federal government, the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. And we also have Chris Johnson from the Queensland Government Department of Environment and Science. Um, if you were here on Wednesday, our first presentation, we spoke about the review of the Water Quality Improvement Plan and the Water Quality Improvement Plan sitting under the Reef 2050 Plan. Those two plans work together to protect the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and while the focus of the Water Quality Improvement Plan has largely been on water quality, we spoke about how the review is looking at creating a more holistic and inclusive narrative. Um, we also spoke about how the review is trying to create a simpler um, framework to which, in which we can then deliver the broad range of programs and projects that uh, Julie and Chris will talk about today. Uh, we also talk about building on successes. So I think the projects that we will cover today are great examples of the work that so many, so many humans have been participating in to care for country, protect the reef. Um, before I hand over, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we are all meeting today. For me, that's Yagara and Turbo country in Mianjin. Um, I pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend my acknowledgement to all the reef traditional owners, both on land and sea country. We've been speaking about that, that connection between land and sea and how we manage systems holistically. So I would like to pay my respects to 65,000 years of holistic whole of system management based on values and, and care for country. If there is First Nations people with us on the line, I pay my respects to you, your culture, your story, and your elders. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Julie. I am going to turn my camera off. Thanks, Maria. Um, just to follow on from Maria's acknowledgement of country, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners on the lands on which I'm meeting from today. For me, that's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. So thanks for joining us today. Um, what I'm going to talk about with yourselves is specifically some, some of the programs that we fund under the Reef Trust. So my name is Julie Steele and I work for the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, and specifically in the Great Barrier Reef branch. So the programs that we look after within our branch are wide ranging and some are previously funded programs and some have been recently funded under the $1.2 billion reef protection package. Alrighty, so as I alluded to before, um, the in 2022, the Australian government committed $1.2 billion to go towards the reef under a, a range of programs and activities. And with this investment, together with the Queensland government, over $5 billion has been invested in the reef since 2014-15. So quite a lot has happened in the last 10 years. Alrighty, so I just thought I'd try to paint a bit of a picture on where some of the programs I'm going to talk about fit within the various um, funding components or um, areas within the Reef Trust. So we have a breadth of programs, as you can just see by the list of um, programs that we've got here. And I won't be talking about all of them today, but I will get into some of them. So programs are quite ran wide ranging. So we have traditional owner led implementation of the traditional owner implementation plan. We've also got projects being funded uh, for Reef Guardian Councils to deliver on their reef action plans. We've also got community focused programs, which are then looking to promote community stewardship for the reef. And then we've also got coastal restoration activities. So the types of programs and uh, funding that we do look after is quite wide ranging. So where I'm going to start with is actually some of the programs that have been funded under the Reef Trust prior to the $1.2 billion package. So these are programs that 
Since 2014, uh, the Reef Trust Special Account was established, which provided the uh, building blocks that we needed in, to fund a range of these programs. Now, there's been heaps of programs funded under the Reef Trust, water quality programs, restoration programs, and I won't be able to go into all of them today. So what I will do, though, is focus on some of the programs that my team specifically looks after. So with that in mind, um, the first program I'll talk about is the, oh, sorry, if we could just go back there, is the uh, $5.5 million uh, dollar program with reef, with Tangaroa Blue for the Reef Clean project. So this, this was launched in 2019, and since that time, the Reef Clean program has delivered hundreds of community cleanups, source reduction programs, collected and recorded more than 120 tonnes of marine debris. So the Tangaroa Blue Foundation has really done an exceptional job at um, delivering on addressing the threat that marine debris um, causes for the reef and the impacts that it has on the biodiversity, tourism appeal, and can often be fatal for marine life. So that's a really great program that has been funded for the last five years with Reef Clean. So additionally, the Australian government's also invested in um, both Indigenous ranger programs and the traditional use of marine resources agreements. So for the Queensland Indigenous Land and Sea Ranger Program, with the $3.2 million investment, this has funded a range of projects to be led and delivered by Queensland Rangers, which are essentially delivering on projects to support the health of the reef. So some of the projects that have been funded under, the, under that include shellfish restoration, seagrass mapping and monitoring, enhancing cultural connectivity through waterways and biocultural indicator assessments of riverine and coastal waters, training of rangers and traditional owners to implement projects which improve the health and resilience of coastal habitats, riparian weed, feral cattle and erosion control to reduce sediment loads into GBR catchments. So that's delivered by the Queensland government and the Commonwealth has just invested into that program. Then the traditional use of marine resources agreements or TUMRAs, um, this is another one where the my department has provided the $6 million investment through the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, who lead on delivering this program. And the Australian government's investment essentially supports the expansion of TUMRAs uh, across the Great Barrier Reef and has also supported uh, strengthening traditional owner capacity through by enabling them to set up their own agreements and partnerships and essentially increasing traditional owner involvement in protecting and managing sea country in the Great Barrier Reef. So another program which is uh, delivered by the Queensland Government, but it's the Nesta Oceans Program. And again, the Commonwealth Government has invested in this program to support its delivery. The most recent investment was $1.4 million provided by the Australian government, which was included a co-contribution from the Queensland government to top up this program. Now, this program's actually been running since 2014, and but and all the funding has essentially supported turtle nest protection and predator control efforts to reduce the threat posed by feral pigs and other predators. And the program has achieved greater than 90% nest survival as a result of predator control and direct nest production. So it's really a great program and is often and is delivered by Indigenous rangers and other groups on the reef as well. So the Reef Trust Partnership, a number of you will know about this program, 4438 million to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, which had six different components. Um, so as you can see, we've got the water quality, crown of thorns, starfish control, reef restoration, adaptation, traditional owner community, and monitoring and reporting. Um, this program has done exceptional things uh, for the reef. The objective was to achieve significant measurable improvement in the health of the Great Barrier Reef and contributing to the Reef 2050 plan. And it's underpinned by innovation, science and community engagement. So I've got some stats on this slide for you, but I'd strongly encourage you to go and visit the dashboard that's on the Great Barrier Reef Foundation's website, which really summarises the great achievements that this partnership has um, achieved to date. Righty, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the new investment and the $1.2 billion and some of the programs that fall under this. So again, this slide uh, represents the various packages under 
the investment and the programs that I'll be speaking to today really are about the ones in italics. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start by going through all of those with you now. So recognising the importance of marine debris management and mitigation, the Commonwealth has invested seven and a half million dollars to continue the efforts there. So this is a program that is being delivered over two grant rounds, competitive grant rounds. So round one has been completed and Tangaroa Blue was the successful uh, applicant through that process. And then round two is planned for 26, 27. But this will ensure that the issues relating to marine debris will continue to be addressed. The government also committed $15 million to the Coastal Marine Ecosystems Research Centre. So this is to ensure that the centre is fully functional with research infrastructure completed, making sure that it's fit for purpose and staffed and able to continue to grow and really ensure that the centre is positioned to support the Australian government, uh, manage and protect the reef through world-class research. So the Reef Guardian Council program, so this is uh, again under the $1.2 billion package and was targeted grants to the 19 Reef Guardian Councils uh, across the reef catchments and is supporting a range of shovel-ready projects for reef protection. So this enabled Reef Guardian Councils to put forward projects that they'd identified as priorities under their reef action plans and is enabling the contribution of projects that are going to help deliver Reef 2050. So some of the projects uh, do, do vary across the Reef 2050 outcomes, but include reducing sediment runoff, improving riparian catchment and wetland habitat, habitats, removing marine debris, controlling threats such as feral species, and reducing carbon emissions. So uh, that was recently announced um, by our minister and all of the details of the projects are available as part of the media release if you want to have a look as well. So Reef Coastal Restoration Program, so $30 million program with up to $2 million available per project. This was a competitive grant round run late last year and uh, the assessment process has been completed. These The projects that have been funded under this program will be imminently announced. Um, so I can't go into too much detail on what the projects are being funded as it's going to be coming soon. But essentially these projects are going to help rehabilitate degraded or previously destroyed reef coastal ecosystems. Many of them are boosting community participation and including partnering with First Nations and also aiming to improve the health and resilience of coastal habitats and ecosystems and then inadvertently accelerating progress towards water quality targets. So there's going to be some really great projects coming out of that, um, which are worth keeping an eye out so you can see more on what's happening there. So the $12.5 million community stewardship program, so that one's actually open right now um, and is uh, open for another five days, actually. And it will also run from this well, next financial year to 29.30 and will be also run across two grant rounds. So for round one of the program, $6.5 million is available and is aiming to fund large coordinated community-based on-ground reef protection projects. Uh, then also we have another citizen science program. This program is currently in the design phase and uh, will come online uh, hopefully next year with details to be confirmed. So the regional report card partnership, 1.26 million from the Australian government contribution over 21-22 to 29-30. This is another program funded by both the Australian government and the Queensland governments and funding's delivered by Queensland who have um, funding agreements with the five regional report card partnerships themselves. And is each partnership produces an annual report card that outlines the condition of the waterways in their regions and the, this data then helps guide decisions and actions on how to improve water quality in the local waterways that flow into the reef. So again, we've got a new commitment under the $1.2 billion package, which is $27.3 million to go towards establishing a traditional owner task force. 
implementation of the traditional owner implementation plan and a futures fund to, to support the ongoing um, funding needs for the traditional owner implementation plan. So we recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people are traditional owners and custodians of the Great Barrier Reef and its catchment and that they hold inherent rights, interests and obligations to protect and care for country. So to support this, on the 16th of November last year, a principles-based agreement to partner has been signed by both the by the Reef 2050 Traditional Land Steering Group, the Commonwealth and Queensland governments, and the agreement is designed to give effect to the rights, interests and aspirations of traditional owners for the reef in delivering the Reef 2050 Traditional Owner Implementation Plan. I'd encourage all of you to go and have a read about what the agreement to partner outlines and also the great work that's being done by traditional owners in implementing the traditional owner implementation plan at reefto.au. So in summary, that really demonstrates that there's so many programs being delivered um, by the Great Barrier Reef Branch in my department. We've got projects that are supporting indirect water quality outcomes, but then also ones that are advertently supporting that. We have programs focusing on restoration, and all of these programs are essentially underpinned and trying to achieve reef, tr reef trust outcomes and also Reef 2050. So I uh, will leave it there and happy to take uh, questions later and hand over to Chris now uh, to continue. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, can I just get a chicken? Every can you hear me? Okay. Thumbs yes, up. we can hear you. Maria. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Emma. Um, yes. Good morning. Good afternoon. In fact, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm a program manager in the office of the Great Barrier Reef and World Heritage in in Desi, the Department of Environment, Science, Innovation in the Queensland Government. So, um. Going to excuse me. Going to cover a little bit now around the Queensland Reef Water Quality Program, and um, you know not the full length and breadth of it, but a bit of a, a, a taster, if you like, um, and some a little bit around the history and also kind of where we are now and where we're going in the next few years. So, for those who haven't heard about it before, the Queensland Reef Water Quality Program is the Queensland government's uh, response to you know, actions within the, the existing reef water quality improvement plan. Um, our current program uh, is running from 2022 20, to 26. And we split our work across what we call four strategic themes. So um, we work heavily in the land management practice um, space and also in, in what we term landscape resilience or landscape remediation, landscape repair. And that's kind of our key on ground areas for action. Um, but we also um, invest and in, with our partners in, in, in DAF and across the agency and other, other areas externally, um, have a number of enabling um, projects and programs. So, um, that includes regional capacity, so looking at the um, you know the humans that are out there able to deliver programs and and support um, you know community outcomes and, and water quality outcomes. So we're we're heavily in that space as well as the underpinning science and and data and monitoring that um, is needed to you know evaluate um, the impact of the investment programs across. You know, Australian government and, and other investors, um, and you know that underpinning knowledge and and science that helps us understand, um, you know, what's happening in our in our catchments and in our creeks and rivers and and out in the reef and also on the land and how to you know best best use that science to uh, design and implement change programs. Oh, and underpinning all of that. I shouldn't forget is our human dimensions program, which um, has been building very, very nicely over the last few years, um, and is a, is a really critical part to understand, um, you know, the communities that we work in and, and landholders and, and stakeholders, and again help us design and implement effective programs. So. Um, the Queensland program um, has had a, a, a large focus on on working with agriculture, 
and um, we've got this this diagram here showing the the extent of agricultural land use within reef catchments. So, um, as I think everyone probably knows, one now the reef catchments are a very large space. Um, so we we have a large um, amount of 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 landholders and stakeholders that we try to work with. Um, and and ag is a is a large a large land use um, up and up and down the reef the reef catchment. So there's a um, a large a large scale. It's a large effort. And it's also quite variable. So um, there's a number of different agricultural commodities. Um, there's different sort of you know degrees of support available. There's different um, demographics everywhere. So. Um, we do we do really try and understand the different catchments are working in and and um, tailor um, our engagement programs and change programs uh, to those very very variables. Next one. Um, so again, the focus of our programs across Australia and Queensland government over a number of years and and continuing on. Um, over the next few years for sure is around the key pollutants. So the scientific consensus statement uh, from 2017 and um, new one coming out again soon um, uh, has DIN, which is dissolved in organic nitrogen and, and sediment as the really key high priority um, pollutants that are impacting on reef water quality and reef health. So those, those two um, pollutants along with um, as a, a lower priority is pesticides, but DIN and sediment have been the key priorities and have been driving a lot of the on-ground programs. Um, so we've got um, a pretty good idea from our existing knowledge base around where those key pollutants are coming from within the catchments, what land uses and to what proportion. So that this, is, I guess, just shows um, how we kind of split our efforts across those those areas and where we can target to get um, to work with different commodities and different catchments to get a um, a response um, and and get good bang for buck from our program investments. So the Queensland program kicked off a few years ago now, going back to two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Um, and since then, it's it's been a real um, journey. Um, I'm lucky lucky enough, I guess, if you, you could say luck, to have been involved since 2009. So I've had a, a really good first-hand experience around, um, yeah, that that journey and where we are today compared to where we started. So I guess underpinning it from the start has been around what's what's the evidence base for you know where where we work and why. And we've continued to build that across, you know, understanding those key agricultural commodities um, and their practices, and where you know dials can be turned to, um, uh, yes, get a reef water quality response, but also to um, engage positively positively with those commodities and get kind of win wins in terms of productivity and profitability. So we've we've engaged with um, a number of growers and and graziers and and industries and other land managers um, for a number of years now across a, a number of different mechanisms. So um, I guess Queensland's responsible for the the reef regulation. So we've got things like a regulatory response, but also um, industry voluntary best management practice programs. Um, our, our DAF counterparts have quite a significant um, and ongoing extension and engagement program across uh, all reef catchments and essentially all agricultural commodities. Um, what else do we do? Also, you know, uh, sort of citizen science and, and on ground um, research projects direct with landholders. So a whole range of, of programs there. And what I guess is is driving that is to collaborate. So to collaborate um, with you know all the relevant stakeholders, bring together researchers um, with industry, with government um, to to go about our work collaboratively, because that's the only way that we um, we're going to really see change on ground and long uh, legacy. Um, 
Thank you. So um, our current uh, supporting agricultural program is what we call under the under our, our Queensland funding. As I said, runs in th through to June 2026. So there's a 125 million dollar program there, working across um, a range of programs. So the continuation of the successful industry BMP programs. Um, we're also looking at more sort of tailored um, on-ground projects, practice change projects in sugarcane and grazing. Uh, there's a continuation of an agricultural extension program uh, for graduates, so trying to build that capacity um, by by facilitating getting those graduates out working with those organisations on the ground and um, then hopefully having a future in, in that workforce. Um, some research and science projects and there's the continued rollout of the reef protection regulations and the compliance program. Um, and if I haven't said it already, also the, the DAF extension program is continuing to be rolled out. Um, just to highlight, I guess, a bit of a flavour of some of the work we've done and many online will kind of know about these, but um, we've done a whole range of projects, but they have, you know, some do stand out for us and we've, we've learnt a lot and they've shaped the way that we um, design our, our, our future program. So there's the Burdick and Nitrogen Trials um, project working with uh, sugarcane growers and industry in the Burdekin focused on, on nitrogen was a, was a highly successful project. Um, it brought together, you know, uh, individual growers, um, researchers and government to um, understand uh, nutrition requirements in, in the Burdekin for nitrogen. And, um, you know, we we're able to establish, you know, that the, the, at the time that those regulated rates were, um, were adequate and a number of those growers of well, essentially all of those growers now see, um, that they can apply those rates and still maintain or even improve their productivity and profitability. Um, and we learn a lot through that in terms of how to design um, projects and, and um, you know, the keys there, and they're no brainers when you look back, but it's collaboration, it's building that trust um, with, with the community um, and investing time. And so that, that project then, um, you know, had spin-offs and, and expanded to other areas and dealing with similar issues, but more locally specific and other catchments. So the RP161 continue to do, you know, nutrient management planning with cane farmers and, and bringing on board sort of tailored agronomy to, um, you know, end up with tailored farm nutrient management that is win-wins for the farmers and, and for reefs. So the, you can see the quotes there from some of the growers um, involved in those projects. It's been um, a very positive experience all around. And um, and from a government perspective, this is also where we've, you know, had opportunities to to um, partner with, say, the Reef Trust Program and, and have co-investment in these really kind of successful and, and game-changing projects. So our current round of um, practice change projects, we've got um, some some cane practice change projects focusing on nutrients that um, started earlier this year. And we're also um, hopeful to have some grazing practice change projects starting starting soon. Okay, so I, another big part of the Queensland Reef Water Quality Program and, and the Australian Government's Reef um, Trust Program is around landscape restoration. So you can see there, I don't know if people are familiar with images like that, but that's essentially a sediment plume um, heading out to the to the reef um, from the catchments from, you know, significant, from a significant rain event. I'm not quite sure exactly the specific event on that one. Someone smarter than me will remember that, but you can see it's, um, yeah, it's significant. So why are we doing this and why um, are the governments investing in this? Well, um, you know, from the catchment, sediment can and, and, and does move. And um, so sort of starting over on the left there, for those that aren't familiar, so we've got, you know, activities happening within the catchment. Let's say it's um, grazing going on, but, you know, sediment can move as a result of a range of land uses and historical and legacy issues like, you know, old mines and, and different things. But um, where we where we lose ground cover in our in our catchments, they become more susceptible to 
um, erosion and loss of that sediment um, when it rains. And you can see sediment moving into, um, you know, the local creeks and rivers. And particularly those fine sediment particles um, can then also travel further out into the inshore reefs and, and mid-shelf reef. And that causes issues for reef health and in terms of things like reducing light availability for um, for corals and smothering seagrasses and um, things like that. So sediment sediment moves and we're trying to work in the catchment to prevent that. So we've got some pretty good science that's been building up over, over the many years around understanding where that sediment is coming from and what are the what are the sources. And we tend to split it up into hill slopes or sort of our grazing paddocks. But we've also got a good understanding now that a, a large proportion of sediment is coming from gullies um, that have formed or indeed stream banks that um, for, for various reasons um, are now eroding. So, as I said, um, hill slopes are, um, you know, uh, are a source of sediment loss. We think now, based on the sort of best available science, that it's um, grazing and stream banks are the more predominant um, source of sediment loss. But it does sort of start, you know, upstream of, say, a gully where you need to be managing your ground cover. And so, yeah, hill slope erosion, or I like to think of that, you know, sort of coming from that's your grazing paddocks and your pastures maintaining ground cover on those areas um, is critical um, to uh, preventing the formation of gullies but also yeah reducing sediment loss and it's also critical to land condition which um, you know is critical to uh, grazing enterprises to sustainability of those grazing enterprises and into the long term and maintaining productivity and profitability so Historically, um, under our, our previous phase, we, we started to um, get into the landscape restoration and, and gully remediation um, areas. So there was a project um, at Strathalbyn Station um, where some significant gullies were remediated by trialling um, a range of different mechanisms. But um, I guess the key takeaway there is that you, with you know, with some significant investment um, and expertise on ground, you can you can fix up these gullies, these big gullies, and get a significant sediment saving um, for that investment. So, I think that sort of gives us confidence that where you know we can we can make funding available, that we can make make a big change. Um, you can see there an example of some gullies that were remediated in, under the Burdick and Major Integrated Project. Um, and the, a nice before and after pick. And again, and so this is Strathalbyn there. You can see on the left a, a gully that has been um, remediated and then in, underneath that some, some of the existing gully complex there. Um, so it's quite significant. And yeah, just is just a little um, video of some of the work's been undertaken at Strathalbyn. So, um, you know, through projects like this and others that we've been able to build the understanding of, you know, what is required to effectively remediate. And it's not just moving dirt around. Um, there's a lot of science there. So you need to look at the soil chemistry. So there's some gypsum being applied here to um, uh, remediate the soil itself because a, a big problem with these gullies is it's highly dispersive soil. Um, but you can also see the um, the amount of earthworks that need to go on to to cut and fill, to reshape, to re, you know, slope and, and batter these landscapes. So um, they're big jobs. They provide um, uh, a lot to the local economies and can provide a lot of um, jobs and also opportunities for training and capacity building. Um, and here's just some some example of a stream bank remediation project. So in this case, it's what we call a pile field. So it's using those you know those those poles there that have been um, incorporated into the repaired stream bank, allowing for stabilisation and recovery of um, vegetation. So this was a, a Australian government reef trust example. So the next um, program. We're calling it a landscape repair joint program between ourselves and the federal government because um, the state and federal government work 
quite closely in how these investments are rolled out. So the, the Under Reef Trust is $200 million for the landscape repair program. In addition to that, there's um, three stream bank remediation projects that we're managing on, the, on their behalf and they've they're underway now. And then under in the Queensland Reef Water Quality Program, there's a $75 million restoring functional landscapes bucket that we're starting to roll out. So just quickly, a quick overview. So that's what's included in that bucket. There's stream bank and gully remediation. Um, we've got an excellent project on a DAF uh, spyglass grazing property, which is going to be able to demonstrate um, some gully remediation techniques. We're still working up in the Cape York um, catchment on Springvale. We're also going into place-based um, projects, which I'll talk more about in a second. We've had the continuation of the successful major integrated projects in the Burdekin and wet tropics. Um, reef Assist, I'll talk about that for a second. Um, reef Assist is a program that began sort of in the COVID response times um, to really um, has a large focus on employment and training and um, and jobs and has been very successful across all the GBR regions in um, achieving some environmental outcomes, some landscape repair, lots and lots of employment and training opportunities for the community, including um, a lot of First Nations um, opportunities. So that's rolling out its 2.0, its second phase at the moment. Uh, we've got a wetlands uh, program and um, under reef credits, which is, for those that don't know, um, it is a market um, program that the Queensland Government has been supporting in some ways uh, since its development. And we've invested $10 million in um, across two organisations there to deliver reef credits uh, for, for DIN and sediment outcomes. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, I talked before about um, place-based approaches. So um, for the Queensland Government, this sort of sits broadly under our restoring functional landscapes. But, um, and we're continuing um, that approach with some um, uh, work being evaluated at the moment to, to continue place-based approaches. But going back in time, this was sort of came out of the reef task force that was convened back in 2016 to um, take a, um, I guess, a bit of a different approach than, than what was usual at the time, which was to, you know, really look at a defined place and to, um, you know, design a program of change kind of from the ground up um, and involve, you know, all the stakeholders to design it locally, um, to get that real buy-in and engagement across um, a given space to deal with the, you know, the intricacies and the, the um, specific things that are happening within that area. And the, the firstly, we went into an area in the Triple Bs in the Burdekin um, and the wet tropics into the Tully and Johnston catchments. So, um, that were they were very interesting um, programs, and for the Queensland government, it was quite a significant investment. It was thirty three million across those two projects. But you know the the value that we've been able to get from that in terms of all sort of learning about how to apply a place based approach, um, the benefits and multiple benefits and co benefits that can come from such a thing. Um, has been, you know, invaluable, and and it's certainly um, somewhere where we're we're looking to continue to go with our investment program. Is are these place based approaches that, um, yes, can get our you know reef water quality outcomes, but can also get so much more in terms of working with the community, jobs, training, um, other other environmental co benefits. Um, we're yet to really start to really tap into that, but I think that's where. Um, these place-based approaches will be able, able to um, to benefit. Oh, that's it. Um, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I think it's safe to say that 
there's so many other projects that we could always talk about. And yes. I think the, thank you so much, Julie and Chris, because the range of projects that not only deliver water quality, but also deliver those those outcomes for reef communities and for reef catchments is I it just it's phenomenal how much work is involved. And a big shout out to anybody who's on the line who's ever participated in one of these or participate in many of these projects. I think a key theme that I hear is that collaboration and partnership um, that really really makes the magic work on the ground. Um, before I turn the recording off, um, this was seminar two in a series of eight, and the intent here is to take everybody on our WQIP review journey um, by giving everybody information around uh, what have we been doing so that we can continue to build on on our successes, but also explore new areas that haven't been explored. Also, how do we create and shape that holistic narrative together? Um, and for that, we really do want people's inputs. If you have participated in reef programs or in other programs that you know have achieved really good outcomes for reef catchments, reef communities, or the reef, um, we have an open survey at the moment. There's the link, little link there. The, Thingy. Um, and it's a great opportunity for um, for that for that input to be shared at a really early part in the policy process. So we are at the very beginning of a journey. Um, and as I said in seminar two, there will be more opportunities to engage. But this is a listening phase, and we really want to listen from you. Um, with that, I'm going to. Turn the recording off so that we can have a question and answers um, moment. And this is your opportunity to ask 